It seems like ever since the inception of video games, there have been games that featured the most awe-inspiring, daring, and noble characters from human history. Ninjas! These shadowy warriors represent the absolute pinnacle of human achievement. Whether they're casually slicing through multiple people, or casting some sort of jutsu to give themselves bigger pecs. Even the earliest of ninja games featured these kinds of abilities. From Ninja Gaiden to Strider and Shinobi, video games have always paid their due respects to the destruction force of the ninja. But something important was missing from the formula behind these early ninja titles. Something that's just as critical to the ninja mythology as those little shoes with the two toes. Stealth. It wasn't until 1998 that an unassuming little title called Tenchu Stealth Assassins would finally deliver onto ninja video games, and video games as a whole, the sneak factor that they so rightfully deserved. And any video game credited with that honor is something that I have to check out for myself. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist. Two quick announcements. Uh, one, if you still want to win the SNES Classic, you want a chance at that and all the other fun stuff with it, click the Gleamio link in the description down below or the URL on screen. You can copy that. We have a couple more weeks before we do that, so don't miss out. Do it right now. And second, today's episode is brought to you by Chrono.gg, our new friends over there. Chrono.gg have a great website where you pay for indie games on the cheap. The games support the devs directly, they support us, and they support the company. And you guys are happy because you get good games on the cheap. Today's game, it's like a 24 hour deal website. Today's deal is Stories Untold. We did an episode on that last week on The Completionist. If you want to check that out to see what the game's about, there is a little eye on the corner of the screen right now. You can see it. Check out the episode, watch it. And if you like what you saw, chrono.gg.tovg. Again, that's chrono.gg slash tovg. Helps us, helps them, helps you guys. So get on it and enjoy the game. Let me know what you think. Now that we got all of that out of the way, today's game is Tenchu. I never played it. Will I like it? Has it aged well? I don't know. Let's begin. Yes! What would eventually come to be known as Tenchu started out as a little independent project from a then unknown studio called Acquire. At the time, Sony Music Entertainment Japan, of all companies, was holding a contest to discover talented, up and coming game developers. After laying eyes on Tenchu, they snapped it up, but the game Sony purchased would end up being very different from what PlayStation owners would inevitably get their hands on. It originally had a futuristic sci fi vibe, which was eventually replaced with the much more unique feudal setting that the franchise would come to be known for. Tenchu also stood out from the crowd thanks to, ironically, its focus on mechanics that prevent the player from standing out from the crowd. Rather than slashing your way through legions of cardboard-thin bad guys with an arsenal of loud-ass flashy attacks, Tenchu quietly encouraged players to creep around obstacles and carefully stalk their prey. And most importantly, it provided a method to help players actually feel like some mother in ninjas! Tenchu was released in 1998, smack dab in the middle of the Polygon era, meaning that the game has a few rough edges, but its role in video game history can't be denied. Tenchu's been described as one of the most influential titles in the stealth genre, with its mechanics paving the way for all kinds of sneaky boys. Sly Cooper, Corvo, yeah, you too, Solid Snake. You all owe a little bit to the little ninja game that could, bitches. To players, Tenchu offered an incredible incredibly unique style of gameplay, and critics appreciated what it brought to the table too. Tenchu saw enough success to spawn a slew of sequels and spin-offs, and even though no entry in the series was quite as beloved as the first one, several of the follow-ups introduced features and refinements that improved the series as a whole. But despite that, the Tenchu franchise has been a bit too stealthy recently. It's been years since a Tenchu game has hit the shelves, which is a shame since I think the market and myself are more than ready for a new one! Let's make this happen! Now, this Tenchu drought might be related to the fact that the rights of the franchise have been passed around more times than a copy of The Lone Ranger on DVD. Activision were the ones to publish the first Tenchu out here in the West, but since then, the rights have gone on to Sega, and as of now, I think the game belongs to... Oh. <sighs> well, sure. I asked for it now. It's only a matter of time. 
Now, completing Tenchu Stealth Assassins will mean beating each level with the best possible ranking, which means getting genuinely good enough at the game to become a mother ghost. There's no BS in my way through this one. I have to practically be invisible, and I have to do it twice since there are two different characters to play as. But at least there are no achievements, no multiplayer, no online. Just pure creeping. I just like to creep and watch. That's not weird. That's voyeurism. What's that? It's like a it's like a weird thing where where, where people just like to watch. What if I kill him after? Is that weird? <laughs> Hell no! Tight, let's do that then. When it comes to aesthetics and general presentation, Tenshu is often rougher than a Spartan fat camp. The interface is often frustrating to deal with, and the game shows its age at almost every turn. However, Tenchu has a handful of exceptional qualities right beneath its surface. Qualities that are both delightful and elicit a nostalgic, man, we've come so far, thank God we've come so far, please let's never go back, kind of feeling. Tenchu has no overarching plot at all, opting for a more episodic approach with its mission system. So instead of going on an epic adventure, you're essentially a ninja lapdog. But hey, at least you're still a ninja. <gasps> technically two ninjas. You can choose to play as either Rikimaru or Ayame, with the former being the classic stoic stick up the butt archetype, and with the latter being one part snark, one part attitude, and two parts murderer. If you worried more about your skill and less about my manners, you'd still be alive. Both are members of the Izuma Ninja clan, loyal to Lord Goda, some powerful Japanese dude. But he does have a daughter named Princess Kiku, and she's downright adorable when she's not giving me the heebie-jeebies. Oh, Ayame, my father will be so very pleased with you. But regardless of who you're playing as, you'll be sent on the same missions throughout the game, which involve everything from delivering secret messages, to extracting important targets, to good old-fashioned hit jobs on lecherous old men. Wow, just look at those hips go. There are a few differences in the narrative depending on who you play as, such as this asshole, who will honorably take his own life when confronted by Rikimaru and the shame of his own treachery, but then he'll throw a hissy fit when confronted by <gasps> a girl? Talk about a relic of a bygone era, poof, be gone. But for the most part, both campaigns are exactly the same, and thanks to the mission structure, they end up feeling like an average week in the life of a ninja, and that's kind of okay. Do I really care about the characters in Tenchu? No, absolutely not, but the backdrop of Japanese folklore and mysticism is plenty engaging. The narrative is mainly conveyed via a smooth-voiced narrator before each level, who explains why your ninja is out and about that particular night, and justifies the murder that's about to take place. As if we need a justification! Give it a rest, dude! Just tell me who needs stabbing! Unfortunately, Tenshu doesn't just have cutscenes. It has unskippable cutscenes! What's worse is that Tenshu is the type of game in which you'll be replaying the same levels over and over to obtain better rankings, which means you'll be seeing a lot of these same damn cutscenes. But there's one silver lining around the dark cutscene cloud, the absolutely Bonkers voice acting. I know what you want. You want the stone. What the f? This is incredible! I realize that this game comes from the era of bad games voice acting, but this is a cut above the rest. You've got bad pacing. Like you, I also answer to a higher authority. Bad scripting. Minister Kataoka sure likes his money. And utterly baffling accents. I see. You have come to meet your fate. I honestly can't tell if these voices were done by actual people with Japanese dialects or by English speaking people impersonating Japanese accents. And I don't know which one would be worse. Every time you think you've heard it all, this game hits you with another brain blowing line read. Uh. The mice come out to play. That means you get to play too. Oh, oh okay. Spanish speaking characters. Okay, let's see if this will shed a light on the situation. Deseas que te maten? Muerete. 
Nope, that voice actor could have been Norwegian for all I know. And to make things even more confusing, the main characters are undoubtedly voiced by native English speakers. I guess you deserve a thank you this time. But the rest of the characters are all a toss up. Only way across this checkpoint is through me. Please forgive my immature sister for her rudeness at the gate. Those two characters are supposed to be siblings. What the hell is going on here? The weirdness also includes incredibly strange sound effects too. Okay. Just listen to this baby crying sound effect that occurs every time you get near this statue. There's no baby here! I checked many times! If I was a parent concerned about my kid, I would go to the statue every day! Now, don't get the wrong idea, I don't dislike the voice acting in Tenchu. In fact, I think it's one of the game's biggest draws at this point. It's like a tourist trap in a small middle American town. As long as you're passing through, you've gotta at least check it out. But there's no getting around how ugly this game often looks. I can imagine how it might have seemed impressive back in the day, but it is toe up from the flow up nowadays. The textures are all flat and muted, the geometry is grotesque, and I feel like I'm gonna poke my eyes out just looking at these character models. Look, Tenchu isn't without its visual inconsistencies either. Enemies will straight up kitty pride right through walls, and the physics are questionable at best. The bugs aren't ever game breaking, but it can break the immersion when you're lying in a fire pit for an extended period of time, without taking any damage, only to walk away unscathed, and then die a few seconds later. Son of a bitch. But I get it. The technology was only capable of so much at the time, and pushing for realism is far harder to do than for going for a more stylistic or cartoony approach. But if the realism they were trying to emulate was a hopeless, endless void, well then they nailed that. Due to the original PlayStation's lack of power, heavy, heavy, heavy blacks were used to obscure distant elements that didn't need to be rendered at the time. There may be some nice variety in the game's locations, including some snowy estates, sleepy villages, and creepy caves, but they all have one thing in common, absolute darkness. It's kind of an elegant solution. Making every mission take place in the dead of night certainly reinforces the ninja theme, and you do get to hide the stuff that would only eat up processing power in the meantime. But if you're gonna play this game today, make sure your TV is set up to handle the darkness levels. What the hell am I doing with my life? Even if you can't see anything, you can still experience what might be the best part about the game. The soundtrack in Tenchu is absolutely f incredible. It's so eclectic and well-produced that it honestly defies classification. Each track starts things off strong in one style, only to slowly shift into a blend with a completely different and yet congruous motif, such as traditional Japanese instruments mixed with acoustic Spanish-inspired guitars. Or how about running strings along with a fat-ass bass line and a flute lead? It ranges all the way from exciting and kinetic to the chillest music you could ever hope to encounter in a video game. Who the hell is behind this? Noriyuki Asakura? Slap this pimp's face on the game's box art, Pat! He deserves it! Tenchu's soundtrack just goes to show that even though something can seem really flawed at first glance, and second glance, and even parts of the third and the fourth, it can still possess really special hidden aspects. It's important to not dismiss games outright when they have apparent problems. Otherwise, we might accidentally throw the genius music and excellent atmosphere out with the bathwater. Sure, Tenchu isn't the prettiest game at the dance, but it's got a lot of great qualities. And yes, I'm aware that that's what people say when someone isn't attractive at all, but this game has legitimately got some quirks to it. <laughs> oh, come on, Tenchu, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> Tenchu's fun factor exists along this gossamer thin thread of the player's skill. As long as you're playing the game as intended and well, it's extremely fun and satisfying. But veer off the chosen path even slightly and you'll fall straight into frustration land. Even when on the road to completion, Tenchu doesn't ask you to go out of your way for hidden items or extraneous game modes. All it asks is that you simply become a ninja god. No big deal. 
Tenchu's comprised of 10 different levels, 11 if you count the short training mission. And although there are several objective types across these missions, one requirement remains ever present. Keep your ass hidden. You've got to patiently observe your enemy's positions and patterns, and then either move around them or take them out. But let's say you're not the patient type of player. Let's say you choose to pick a fight with every goon you come across. Or maybe you're content with running right past everyone, trailing them behind like you're some kind of pajama Pied Piper. Not only would that experience be tough as nails to beat, but your ending score would take more than a few dings. Your rankings can range from Thug all the way to Grand Master, depending on things like the number of undetected kills you made, how many times you were spotted, and how long you took to complete the mission. There are a couple of basic ninja techniques to help you complete your missions, including dashes and super jumps and all kinds of cool stuff. But even though they're relatively easy to perform, good luck using this stuff consistently. Thanks to the incredibly stiff controls and camera, the simplest of actions become a nightmare. First off, Tenchu released too early to take advantage of the DualShock, so there's no stick dedicated to the camera. Instead, you have to hold down a shoulder button in order to move the camera, which means that you lose all control of your character's movement. Oh, and the camera controls are locked into inverted mode as well. Talk about a relic of a bygone era. Poof! be gone. Even when you have time to stop and mess with the camera, the damn thing is so unwieldy that it can make you nauseous. God forbid you have to whip this thing around too quickly. The game will freak out. Many of my good runs have been ruined by me stopping to wrestle with the camera, only to then be spotted by some schmuck who just happened to wander over to me. And then there are the controls, which are just as rigid. Just because you're working with tank controls doesn't mean that we have to move like we ate one. Moving in a straight line is no problem, but anytime you want to turn, things get excruciatingly slow. Thank God for the quick turn option. It's simple but crucial missteps like the camera and controls that keep players from enjoying Tenchu the way they want to. It's either play slow and stealthily or nothing. Thankfully, the stealth element is pretty well executed. It's all handled with a single button. Holding it down will immediately make you drop to the floor like you heard gunshots, or slide along the wall if you press the stealth button when you're near one. These techniques make you much harder to be seen by the enemy and give you access to a few new moves, including stealthy rolls that allow you to travel silently, but somewhat quickly. Your reward for remaining in the shadows is the opportunity to sneak up behind unaware foes and perform insta-kills. One touch. No sound, just death. There are a couple of different animations depending on what side you initiate the kill from, but honestly, slashing them from a little bit further away still results in insta-death, and it's far faster and safer. That being said, there is something satisfying about those flashy kills. Another nifty way to stay out of sight is to stay high above the enemy. They don't look up too often, and having a bird's eye view is a great way to formulate a plan of action. You can reach these cool spots using the only ninja tool that'll stay in your inventory for the entire game, the grappling hook. If the spot is high enough and the terrain is acceptable, you can Batman your way up and plot your next kill. Oh wait, Batman doesn't kill. Um, I guess you can brood for a while. Other ninja tools are unlocked and progressively stocked as you complete levels. The tools of the trade include health potions, smoke pellets, explosives, and shurikens, which are great for taking out low health targets at long range. Like these attack dogs right here. Oh, I wasn't prepared for that. Way sadder than I thought. But my favorite item of all has to be the poison rice. When a hapless enemy picks it up and eats it, they'll occasionally stop in their tracks and wince in pain, leaving them wide open to a swift death. But its real use is in drawing enemies off of their usual patrol paths. If you're quick enough, you can even ace them out before they even finish eating their rice. You better pick that rice back up and reuse it. You think that stuff grows on trees? This is a rice-based household. You eat your rice. What's even more invaluable is the key meter, which gives you a sixth sense of how the local enemy forces are feeling that day. Each symbol has a different meaning, starting out with the blue question mark. It means that the nearest enemy has no idea that you even exist, or that they're about to get gutted. And the little number next to the question mark indicates the distance between you and that enemy. That number is the single most useful way to consistently stay out of sight. Without even laying eyes on anyone, you can tell if anyone's near, 
there, if they're stationary, or if they're moving towards you. But if an enemy sees you in the distance, your key meter will change to a yellow exclamation point. This means someone's looking right at you, but they're not entirely sure what they're looking at. You still got a chance to dip back into the shadows, but you've got to do it quickly, because whoever spotted you might be cautiously making their way towards you. And then there's the purple exclamation point slash question mark combo, which means that the enemies are on high alert. They've been triggered by some sort of loud noise, or maybe the occasional dead body left on the floor once in a while, and now they're searching high and low for you. It's a pretty bad idea to try and advance during these alerted states, since you can't use the key meter's number to determine the enemy's position. Not to mention the fact that when alerted, the enemies seem to have freaking eagle sights. And if you really mess up, you'll get the double red exclamation point, which means they've spotted you and they're coming to get you. Congratulations, you f***ed up. Push has come to shove, and now it's time to go on the offensive, you poor bastard. See, Tenchu's combat system is less than optimal. The fighting is clunky as all hell, thanks to those same old stiff controls. If the enemy stayed right in front of you at all times, then that would be one thing. But if one enemy spots you, the fight will most likely spill over to the sight line of another baddie, and so on and so forth until you're surrounded and you just want to lie down and go to sleep forever. The fighting system is so one-dimensional that you can basically just mash your way to victory against most foes, and merely blocking and punishing the occasional smart guys who actually have a little bit of defense. It's plenty brain dead and pretty unfun, but that doesn't stop the stealth elements from being worthwhile. In fact, the terrible fighting only guides players towards the sneakier way of life even faster. Sure, it would be great if the hand-to-hand -hand stuff was better implemented, but I don't feel like I'm missing out much. Getting Grandmaster rankings is a matter of completely avoiding the unjoyable parts of this game, and devoting yourself to the parts that have stood the test of time, which is fine by me. Tenchu can become a slog each time you make a slight mistake, but I still ended up enjoying the stealth features and playing out my ninja fantasies. Bradley, uh, have you seen Gerard? No, he was looking for Ted. I haven't seen him since. Great, well, Beer Bros is starting. Just please let me know if you see him, okay? Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, so here's the skinny people. Tenchu features some pretty cool rewards for its players. And the best part is, is that those goodies are gradually unlocked as you complete the game. It turns out that those Grand Master rankings are actually good for something. Earning that rank on each level will unlock secret ninja tools, bringing you several steps closer to becoming the ultimate ninja god that you were destined to become. These items are the cream of the assassin crop. They feature stuff like a multi-directional super shuriken, a light, foot scroll that taps you directly into the speed force, and a dog bone that summons a sidekick pup to help tear down bad dudes. Essentially, these are the weapons that'll have the bad guys complaining to their superiors about unfair work environments. But one secret item clearly stands above the rest in terms of utility and comedy. The Chameleon Spell. Using this thing temporarily transforms you into a clone of one of your local enemy types. You're still able to perform all of your shinobi moves, but no one will bat even an eye at you, even if you're just waltzing right by them. The moment you attack a foe in any way, the spell will be broken, the guys will be dropped, and it's open season on your ass. But if you play it cool, you can just casually stroll your way to Grandmaster ranking in most levels. Oh, you all messed up giving me access to this kind of tech. I'm Gary Oldman. I could be anyone. Uh, this is day three. They still expect nothing, and I'm successfully fighting their urges to spill their blood under the moonlight, but I'm confident that my willpower will, ah, uh, you know, very good then. The secret items make Tenshu better in a lot of ways. They increase the number of ways you can stealthily accomplish your goals. They further encourage you to go for the highest rankings. And I guess there's some tools that help with the combat too. But whatever, who cares about that? But alas, there's absolutely no reward for gathering them all. However, the player being rewarded as they progress and the relatively short length of the completion journey keeps the depressing lack of a 100% completion bonus from stinging too hard. Tenshu's various cheats also helps soften the blow too. There's the stuff you'd expect to see out of the cheats, like infinite items and refillable health, but the game gets busted wide open with the inclusion of a full-on debug mode. Once you access the debug menu, you can spawn whatever the hell you want wherever the hell you want. You can create your own custom levels with custom enemies and lay 
layouts. It's honestly incredible and adds tons of replayability to the game. Thanks to debug mode, Tenchu went from a ninja simulator to a ninja simulator maker. And here's a bear, and there is a bear, and now there's even more bears. Tenchu tastes like a gumball that's initially sour as hell, but then quickly gives way to long-lasting sweetness. My awkward period with the game didn't last long, and I was able to enjoy the good portions of it pretty soon after that. Completing it doesn't ask much of the player, and actually going for Grandmaster is the most fun thing you could do in the game anyway. I've certainly had enough Tenchu for a while, but I'll still be keeping my ear to the ground for any rumblings of a modern-day follow-up. <sighs> yes even if it comes from you-know-who. While I completed Tenchu Stealth Assassins, there were 14 deaths, 22 Grand Master rankings earned, 11 secret items unlocked, 17 hours of total playtime, and a 50% chance that all the voice acting in this game is actually incredibly offensive. At this point, though, I can never know, so I don't care. He, he, he should be back soon. <laughs> <gasps> If you're in the mood to complete a stealth game, there are honestly lots of better games to play. But if you're down for some old school stylings and don't mind a few imperfections, and you're looking for a genuine ninja experience, then Tenchu might just be what the doctor ordered. Considering the lack of meaningful rewards, it may not be worth it to do it all. But Tenchu is definitely worth a stab in the dark. Tenchu is the kind of game that marks a good example as to what that era was when the game was made. It doesn't look very good, the soundtrack's really bumping, but the combat and the camera controls make this game kind of difficult to play. From a stealth perspective, a ninja game, this does a very good job at making you feel like a powerful ninja. But if you're not into that kind of thing and you want more finesse in, in regards to combat, then I could see why this game wouldn't be for everyone. So with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it. Finish it. That's all the time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let me know about today's episode somewhere on the internet. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button. We do videos on Tuesdays and Fridays now. And if you want to join us on Patreon, you want to support the show, patreon.com slash that one video gamer. Join these cool cats over here. This week's episode is brought to you by chrono.gg slash tovg. If you want to buy stories untold, you can do that at that website. Or hey, if you want to watch the episode, you can click or tap that right here on screen. I've been Gerard the Completionist. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week for another brand new episode of The Completionist. Bye.